Hello. 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 How's it going, everyone? Much better now we are talking. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I can hear that. All right. So let's just wait a few more moments and let a couple more people get joined. Um, I would point you guys to the agenda doc, which is in the meeting invite. Um, and I would encourage anyone to add agenda items for this or future meetings um, in order to ensure that they can be discussed here. So please feel free to do that. And I see some of you are adding your names to the attendees list, so that's great. And I wonder, um, I see Andrew is here. Um, I'd like to thank him for setting this up uh, as this is our first kind of SIG storage meeting. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to mention, Andrew, at the beginning as we get organized. This is for Kubvert. Yes, yes. It's uh, for the basically storage topics related to for Kubvert, yes. All right. And I'm trying to see who, um, I'm not exactly sure who has uh, each of in, uh, individual agenda item. Uh, let's see. So we have the VM definition contents on VM export. Maybe I should share my screen. Let's see if I can do that. Let's see. OK. All right, so you guys should see the screen. All right. Um, let's see. I think maybe Alexander Wells may have added the first uh, item, and I don't see him here yet. All right. Um, let's see. Who has the next uh, topic, uh, BZ, VM snapshot, and wait for first consumer? VM restore topic. It was me. All right. Do you want to take that on to start with um, and introduce it? Yeah. So the problem is uh, when you have a, a storage that uh, is snapshot capable, but at the same time, uh, it can be wait first consumer. Uh, and we create a snapshot and create a um, VM restore. And this VM restore object uh, doesn't get to complete state because the restore DV stays the wait first consumer and the PVC stays pending and um, um, it eventually starts importing when when we try to start the restored uh, VM, but um, I'm not sure if like as a user, if I create the restore object and it's not completed, I'm not sure that I'm gonna try to start the VM. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of leaving us in a situation where the restore appears like it's not successful, but everything actually is OK. Um, right, so I see that you've proposed a couple of solutions here. Yeah, like one, one possible way is to mark VM restore is complete, even if DV is wait first consumer and PVC is pending, but I see that many things can go wrong if we will mark it complete, but uh, DV will not uh, uh, be succeeded. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, another suggestion is to add uh, immediate immediate binding annotation. Only in this case, if it's uh, a snapshot of uh, and 
it's a weight first consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask how does this work usually for containers? I mean, they should have a similar problem, right? So I guess, yeah, for a, for a non VM workload, you would re you're basically just restoring the, uh, the PVC from a uh, snapshot. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you're probably running your pod along with that. So I think in that case, yeah, it would just, the, it, it would stay wait for first consumer until you, <clears throat> until you run the pod. So we have something for the import use case where um, we create um, like a doppelganger pod, I guess is the best yeah. way to describe it, that that causes uh, like forces things to kind of get moving. So we're not in a stuck situation and then um, CDI is able to do the import. So yeah, we've changed the behavior kind of for this particular case. Um, for the restore, it might be okay. I think um to to have it um be marked complete the what i worry about option two with the annotation is um like i'm thinking about this in terms of what is the behavior i guess we we probably don't really care let's say if a um if a vm hold on a second i'm actually I always confuse myself with wait for first consumer versus um, local storage, but you can actually have uh, non-local storage that's wait for first consumer. So that's never mind. Uh, my point is not relevant here. Um, the bind immediate though it can can cause unwanted side effects um, if we're binding it where we're not going to actually run the the VM. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then, okay, the third option is let the controller start and stop the restored VM. So this would be essentially the doppelganger approach. Um, anyone have thoughts on this particular one? I know it's a pretty, like, specific case. So since we're working on populators, if we have a populator, we, you know, the problem should go away. Mm -hmm. And I think in the populator's case, we're going to be tolerating the, um, how, actually, how is that going to Yeah, I don't see, I don't see how a populator would change this at all. It, it, isn't a populator just basically an inner container on the VM and when it starts, it will populate the disk images? No, not at all. Oh, well then, uh, I'm completely misunderstanding what's going on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can, I don't know when exactly the restore is marked as complete, but it could be potentially be complete what, um, uh, once all the resources are created and updated. If that's the issue, just that <clears throat> is false until the VM starts, is that the issue? It's because the... Um... Right, the, the PVC is impending um, until the VM actually gets started. So everything is good to go, but because we're waiting for the PVC to be bound. Um, it's yeah, hard. I mean, I'm surprised that we're waiting on that, but yeah, we shouldn't. I think once everything has been created and uh, um, the restore should be considered complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I tend to agree in terms of things that could go wrong. It's really just if that restore part goes wrong, but that's outside the purview of anything that Kubert can do. So it seems like this might be the right, this first suggestion is the right approach. Um, like that here. Um, and uh, we can start to go on to the next topic. Um, I don't know if we wanted to bounce up to the first item, the VM definition. Uh, Alexander, that might be your item, right? Y yes. I, okay. I just uh, wanted to sort of uh, explain uh, what's going on right now and, and see if anybody has any uh, thoughts or suggestions. 
So basically we recently added a, a VM export um, functionality. Um, and essentially it, it starts a, a pod and, and it allows you to uh, download disk images in, in either raw or compressed format. Um, and the, the second phase where we're in now is where we've added a, or we're, we're adding a new uh, REST endpoint on the same pod. And that REST endpoint will contain, uh, if, if the uh, source of the export was a, a virtual machine or a virtual machine snapshot, the uh, endpoint will contain the definition of the virtual machine. So you can download the definition and apply it to a different cluster or, or something like that. And sort of there's a, a few open or open questions on, on what we want to do. Um, so, Alexander, could yeah. I just ask, um, do you happen to have an, uh, a draft PR or an open PR for this? Um, uh, not yet. I, okay. I, I have a local version. I, I haven't pushed a, a draft PR up yet. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, but basically, um, what it does when generating this, this VM definition, it takes the, the source VM definition, uh, runs it through the uh, instance types uh, and preference types, and expands it into a fully expanded uh, virtual machine. So there's no instance types or, or anything in the actual output. Um, and then it looks for uh, data volume templates and um, replaces the source of the data volume templates with the URL of the export endpoint. Um, if there's no data volume templates, but there's a PVC or a data volume source in the VM itself, it will generate uh, data volumes. Um, this um, makes the assumption that CDI will be available wherever we're trying to um, you know, create this new uh, virtual machine. Um, so I, my, my question sort of is, is, is that a, a reasonable assumption? Um, or, you know, people might not use CDI. And then you know, I don't know how useful this whole REST endpoint is without CDI. Uh, you know, it, it's just the VM definition and, and uh, you can't do much with it at that point. So um, does anybody have any you know, issues or, or questions about that? Um, okay. So one, one use, one usage pattern, first of all, I think that the CDI, you know, the usage pattern of uh, importing it into a different cluster is a good and interesting one, uh, which mm -hmm. sounds like this will solve really well. Uh, one other use case that I wonder about is, so in the VM export, there exists the URLs to just download the, the disks locally. So if somebody right. was trying to basically pull all the pieces down to like a local workstation and cobble things together, in that case, the, um, the XML with the source references wouldn't make sense uh, in the CDI anymore. But again, I don't know exactly what people would do with that. They'd, they still would have to rewrite the... XML slightly, like for example, if they were doing an upload or whatever they're doing. So as long as it's pretty obvious how you would replace those, which I guess it is, because if you understand the format. Right, it's it's just replacing the, the source in the data volume to be, you know, whatever it is you want to be if you have an alternate source. I, I've seen somebody that sort of wanted to take um, the, the exported um, disk images, store them in an S3 bucket, and then use the S3 bucket as a source for for you know creating copies of this virtual machine, sort of like an offline storage, and then create mm -hmm. new VMs in other clusters. So. Yeah, and I think it's important for us to kind of mention too that um, with this feature. Like, I think we're trying to do things in an incremental approach that we're not trying to create a canonical kubevert VM format, like a, uh, you know, right. like a self-contained format or anything like that. We're just trying to kind of have a raw export capability, see how people use that. And then we can figure out what the next steps are in terms of how it might be useful. All right, let's see, uh, Richard something in there so well i 
I don't know if you can hear me because yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So with ImageIO, we um, we're looking at actually both uploading and downloading disk images. This is for Rev. And one idea that we had, we didn't implement it in the end, but we think it would be much more efficient with, with um, creating an MBD endpoint, um, which is basically a TCP socket, uh, encrypted with TLS PSK, which is like a very lightweight form of TLS, and you just need to share a shared key with the, um, with the downloader. So the advantage of this is that you, the downloading tools we have for MBD are much more efficient than just downloading everything over HTTP. I mean, obviously, if you're already compressing stuff, then that's probably not true. But if you're um, if you're just sort of downloading raw disk blocks, then the MBD one would skip over all the blank space and stuff. So, mm. so, so we provide two two endpoints actually: a, a a raw endpoint and a compressed endpoint. So, and then. Uh, by default, for the you know, VM definition I'm generating, I'm actually putting in the uh, compressed endpoint. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm not, I'm not going to say this is what you're doing is wrong or anything. Just um, that this is something to explore. Right. Um, I mean, we we also have like you know MBD URIs, which which means you can actually canonically refer to a specific remote location with a defined format and everything. So we sort of solved a bunch of those kind of problems. But, yeah, it's up to you. So since we oh go ahead, Alexander. I didn't say anything. Okay, sorry. I thought someone was jumping in here. Um I had one comment uh since since we've got Richard here too and I would wonder would uh would any of the uh V to <clears throat> excuse me, V to V or guest FS type of utilities want to use uh, an export of this nature, or would they be more likely to um, to build things, uh, essentially build the export uh, environment by itself, I guess, would be the question. I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I'm not really sure what the use case of this is, actually, um, in general. I mean, if we were talking about, for example, modifying disk images, then having a, a an actual modifiable which is not what you're talking about because it's just downloading but if you if you could also mm -hmm. modify then that would be interesting although kind of exciting in the way that you'd have to ensure that the vm was sort of switched off at the same time mm -hmm. the downloading case seems unlikely to me because if you surely it'd be more efficient if you're moving a vm between clusters to have like the destination cluster talk to the source cluster and, and send it that way rather than having to you know download it to your laptop and upload it somewhere else. Right. I, I don't know what the use case is, so I'm not sure. You know. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so currently we... that, That's exactly the use case, is, is going from one cluster to another and having the target cluster connect to the source cluster directly. Um, the, there's a, a few more things that we need to generate so that CDI can properly connect to the source cluster, uh, in particular the uh, uh, source uh, CA cert, so that it, it knows it's uh, talking to the right endpoint. And then there's also a um, you know secret token to authenticate that you're actually allowed to talk to this endpoint. Uh, so. this, is, this is where TLS PSK is so much better because you get rid of that whole certificate nonsense with TLS and it just, it's so much easier to deploy. Assuming you've already got a secure, like a REST secure channel to send the shared key over. Well, it, it's essentially the, the, the CA cert is, is just, you know, if you talk to any HTTP endpoint, you need to know that you're talking to, to the actual correct endpoint. And that's what this cert is for too. So you can, um, so you can determine that the endpoint you're talking to is the right one. It's not like a man in the middle yeah, no, or something like that. No, I, I totally appreciate that. Can I talk something? Yeah, please. Uh, we are doing this in large scale for you to understand. Uh, we have a VGI service on top of Kubevert, and we have <clears throat> 100 clusters with 1,250 nodes each cluster. And to do that, uh, also for you know, we 
update on a weekly basis the golden, what we call golden image of Windows, Linux, and Mac that we offer as part of our service, uh, completely automated via CI CG, for you understand. We didn't find a, another way that you are mentioning about certificate and things. For us, this doesn't fit our needs because when I, during the clone, downloading first the files, this is take a lot of time. And for us, we keep a, uh, the latest version always in the local storage of each node for you understand uh, of the cluster to be able to, to be cloned. This is mm -hmm. what we have done so far in automated way, way over CICG automation. Uh, copies for small uh, deployments, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I understand you're talking about the uh, like the VM provisioning flow um, and sort of the maintenance or the, the yeah the creation and update of the golden images uh, that are used as sources there uh, sounds like you've got a, a pretty good approach there. Um, just wanting to kind of make sure that uh, I understand you right um, because the uh, the feature that we're discussing here is more about exporting so this is wouldn't be about provisioning but more like if you have uh, a VM that needs to move to a different cluster or to be backed up somewhere. Uh, now I understand it's like the server that I have running here I need to run in another cluster. Right. Uh, we would like to have that also let me explain you why. Uh, if it's possible to later on, we are working in a, not another a solution to do that, to do live migration across clusters. Mm, okay. Okay. We are interested to, to interact with the, the, the team that are doing that. Because uh, what we are doing, it's already available to do live migration when we have a simple CPU attached but we are doing live migration with GPU attached on the VM, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is what we are working on uh, to make it available because this, this is not available on the convert solution and we must have on our solution, okay? Mm -hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> cool. uh, Adam, um, yes. Do we plan to have some kind of live migration with the export? I mean, as far as I understand, the exporter you, I don't know, the VM doesn't need to write on the on the disk. Or... This this particular export the VM has to be down. Uh, the export actually will not uh, become ready if the VM is running. Okay. Or you can be a VM. Uh, well, you can take a snapshot of the VM and then export the snapshot though. Right, you can take a snapshot okay. and do it that way, but no, no live export or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, but these all of these different use cases are interesting. So I really appreciate hearing about, um, you know, how how people are, um, you know, consuming this or intending to, and the goal is to kind of put something out that's a raw sort of low level uh, type of feature, and then let's see how people use it, and we can you know, build, build on as we go. Exactly. Uh, I, I was just, you know, my, my questions were just around, I'm, I'm thinking about putting, you know, this on the rest endpoint. Um, does that make any sense? Uh, or, you know, is there anything I'm missing or is there anything I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing? Um, for the use case where I want to basically just copy a VM from one cluster to another or download it to your local machine or some other storage uh, for backup purposes. That's that's the, the use case. Do we have, uh, Alexander, do we have a design doc in the Kubevert community repo for VM export? Yes. Okay, it would be real cool if uh, perhaps if you could link it, uh, maybe like right right here or something, just so that folks who are who are curious can get some more context. Yes, let me go find it real quick. Yeah, it okay, was and the, the doc that exists is mostly about the, the just the raw disk export. We should probably expand it to include the 
a, a new spec, a new design for the um, manifests and stuff. But or Definitely. maybe we can add it to that doc. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as live migrating between clusters, I think that's really cool and interesting. But I think um, you know uh, the whole live migration requiring shared storage and and all that. We may have to start investigating basically the other mode of live migration where you copy storage. Um, so I think that, that you know, for my yeah, migrating between clusters, having shared storage may be prohibitive in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Also, another tangential uh, point here that, that I'm starting to think about, and some of us are, is um, disaster recovery and doing replication to a cluster. And you can have, you know, synchronous or asynchronous replication, uh, depending on what your use case is and what the environment or the distance between the clusters. Um, it's not exactly live migration, but it's kind of like another flavor of this uh, multi-cluster view of the world. So a lot of this stuff is, you know, I think becoming topical and we're definitely interested in hearing, um, like I, I'm, this is one of the great things about, I think about this call is to get, to just get a view on how different people are, are using, using Qvert and the storage parts. Um, so if I can, I'd like to jump down to the next topic just to make sure that we get enough time to, uh, to cover everything. So let's bring up uh, Seth deduplication. Uh, this is me again, Andre from the desk. Uh, I, I, we are doing a large deployment here. For you understand the size is 125,000 nodes with 1 million VMs. Okay. Mm -hmm. With that, we cannot use something that uh, across the cluster we was using on the beginning Ceph and Ceph uh, the, the duplication part is on alpha stage. We cannot use it. And then we find a very good solution that is also open source, call it Lean Store, that fill all the gaps missing on the, the set. I don't know why uh, Covert still recommends to use Ceph until it has uh, production uh, 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 solution uh, uh, to, with the duplication, this is no go with SAF for me, okay? And also uh, the second item, with that solution, I'm able to mimic what uh, is called a VMware instant clone with uh, cloning with copy on write. I can instantly have the, the clone uh, of the master VM uh, the users is less than two, two, three seconds. We are able to clone it uh, completely against uh, the, the, the regular solution of cloning that takes for Windows a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. So are you, are, are you using the uh, smart clone function? At, well, it's a, it sounds like you're not using stuff anymore. No, I'm using more. the solution from Lean Store itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. They have the amount solution. <laughs> completely different yeah. from from convert and that's why i uh, would like to raise a hand here let's move away from ceph because it's not feature complete doesn't have lots of features that must be in place to to do a large scale deployment okay yeah so i just have two, i have two comments i wanted to add so first of all with with smart clone um with ceph you can achieve a pretty i don't know if it's uh, I don't know, Michael, what would you say? Like, it's a few seconds that we can achieve on a large clone and it doesn't matter how large the volume is because we we clone from snapshot. So it's a it's an efficient clone uh, from Seth's point of view. Um, so I would mention that. And secondly, what I would say is one of the big challenges that I think we have is we really want to be storage agnostic and essentially you should be able to run VMs on any storage that's supported by Kubernetes. We really tried to do that. Um, yeah, we're looking for optimal platforms that give us the most features and the best experience. Um, so I'm definitely gonna be looking into Lin Store to understand uh, what it is, but we definitely have to maintain a neutral footing in terms of the storage that, um, yeah. that we'll support. 
it has also another feature that is I, I didn't list here. Uh, we use RAM as the actually disk of the user, where the the PVC are uh, are actually uh, running on, and with this RAM disk, uh, I'm not able to do this from Ceph. And RAM disk is available from Lim Store. I can use actually RAM as a disk. Then I have <laughs> one million times faster than SSDs, for you understand. Mm -hmm. And with the duplication together, we can have like uh, 100 VMs with 300 gigs. And each VM has 100 gigs, <laughs> for you understand. Mm -hmm. For you understand. We reach 90% the duplication. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I think it yeah, that's be... really uh, impressive. But yeah, we try to just leverage the whatever Kubernetes primitives are available. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering when you were when your cloning was very slow for you. I wonder if um, perhaps volume snapshots weren't uh, configured correctly or or something. Perhaps it's something that I'm doing wrong. <laughs> That's why I raised my hand. I was not able to mm -hmm. do that because the duplications of set is on in alpha stage. And then we was on Jeopardy to use it for you understand. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about your architecture and your platform. Uh, so if you guys were ever interested in you know, sharing more about that or doing a doing a talk sometime, uh, you know, at, at uh, Cubevert Summit or something uh, about how you have your stuff set up. I think that could be informative. I know it's probably also uh, your secret sauce to some extent, but no, this is the the Cubevert is not secret for sure. The secret <laughs> is the other parts for you understand. Okay. Gotcha. Well, we uh, well we sync up with the people from the Ceph team occasionally, and we can see what the status of the duplication is, or at least ask. I mean, we probably can't get a commitment on when it won't be alpha, but yeah, that's why. <laughs> okay, yeah. We'll see, uh, how to we'll put see the we can figure out. This is how are we, we are this is together. Okay. Uh, we could look at maybe adding an, a new lane that uses Lenstore uh, for testing. I'm assuming you would uh, like that so that you have a slight better um, confidence that everything still works when we're running a, a CI lane. Yeah. Uh, we, we can look into that. Yeah, we should. I, I haven't really uh, been exposed to this provisioner uh, before today, so it's definitely something I'm interested in in seeing. Please take a look. It's a very stable solution. Has completely, let's say, feature rich integration with Kubernetes and Kubevert, and is on our mind the best solution to be used. Is it open source? It's yeah. open source. The, if you follow the link uh, for their GitHub, they actually have a specific kubevert. Uh, if you go to examples, yeah, then there's a kubevert uh, under there, and there's a uh, exactly how cool. to do it. So yeah, that's interesting. Nice. All right. And they are enhanced more with our use case. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, it looks like I'm, I'm making some assumptions here based on names, which may be uh, misguided, but I see LVM thin, so maybe it's using LVM behind the scenes. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely be taking a look at this. All right, anything else on this topic before we move to Richard's question? I'm fine. All right, sounds good. Sorry, this, this question is almost stupidly simple. It's like the opposite of the previous question in a way. Um, on my KCLI um, Kubert instance, which has got one node, I'm currently creating uh, storage by basically SSHing into the node, creating loop devices, and then um, creating, I think, local 
uh, persistent volumes from those. Is that like how it's supposed to be done? Because it seems like really weird and hacky to do that. Or, or is this just something I'm missing about how to do this properly? <clears throat> yeah, so for block, block. Sorry, the Sorry. little echo there. So for block storage, I mean, that's definitely a, uh, a bit of a clunky way to go about it. There is a uh, local storage provisioner that's capable of discovering uh, block devices uh, and then, uh, you know, automatically making them available. Um, I don't remember if that handles recycling. I don't know if somebody else knows about that so that you can actually use them and give them back. But are you uh, talking about the local storage operator? Yeah. Yeah, that does not do the recycling. OK. So yeah, so LSO is more about, uh, usually it's it's used for example by stuff where um, uh, the local storage operator will discover the devices on the nodes, make them available as PVs in a storage class, and then a, uh, a storage system will sit on top of that and consume those. Um, this is how stuff works to actually get its storage. Um, but yeah, just for testing the block devices like you're doing, I mean, that's for a testing environment, probably mm -hmm. about as good as you're gonna get, I would say. Um, yes. We also have Topo LVM and uh, Liche, you have something. Yeah, I just want to ask you, Richard, if, um, do you have already local disk? I mean, I have a disk locally, if that's, if that's mm -hmm. what you made. <laughs> yeah, and... Yeah. Do you want to see a side driver or is will be enough to have a reference to the PVC? Because in that case, you can just um, create manually a, um, a PV and PVC bound together and then uh, your VM can start using that device. I can send you a, an example if you, if you need. Uh, uh, yeah, that'd be really cool. I think that's possibly what I'm doing. But if you could send the example, I'll. I'll... Yeah, we, I will send you the. Um, I will send you the PV PVC, and then basically you just need to reference the path of the device. Yeah, I, yeah. I will send. You. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thanks. Um, that's, and that's I would it. say. I'm sorry. Okay. And I think you know, blo block storage is a little bit more um complex and if you if you're okay with you know file file based storage something like uh hpp that we have um you know just for a development environment might be simpler so it really depends on what you're trying to do though it seems like it's not really used very much i mean there's not very much sort of out there about it i mean everyone seems to use you know nfs or just file storage for, for containers that's the sort of impression I got anyway, I don't know. Yeah, so HPP, I we found to be, uh, it's, we noticed that it seems to be used by people who are doing um, POCs or just kind of getting started. It's a real great way to, um, to solve the problem of dynamic provisioning with local storage um, in terms of, you know, how far how far you get mileage with that you know that would depend i suppose but um i assume for you just looking for an environment to be playing around with it could be very adequate for your needs all right so i have um are there any other topics we want to discuss there's a couple of github issues one of the things that um i thought it would be useful to do in um in this call is to uh, periodically go over some of the issues that we have uh, just to make sure that those are getting addressed. So um, I thought we would open up a couple of these and I'll do that now. <clears throat> so the first I would, one. I would like to ask one thing before that, Adam. Sure. Yep. Is there anyone, uh, I know that is uh, a repository on Quai.io for Ubuntu, Fedora, like the latest image be ready to be copied, but no one is doing for Windows. 
Yeah, I think that just has to do with like licensing um, and redistribution rules from Microsoft. So they have, I mean, I think they have some cloud images that are behind a, like a authentication or something, as far as I know. Does anybody else have any suggestions or uh, thoughts on it? I, I tried looking for them, I couldn't find them. So I, I had to uh, download the ISO and install it manually. Yeah, it's definitely something that'd be nice to see them um, distributing more regularly in this modern environment, but. Uh, let me show you one site that I'm using. Is this one here? Uh, this site provides from Microsoft <coughs> the actual files, and they are able to build the latest and greatest for Windows 10 and Windows 11. And there is someone doing also for the servers also, 2016, 19, and 22. They built with that script, uh, and there is an API also to be able to reach it. That behind the scenes grab the files direct from Microsoft. Then is no problem with that, okay? Because yes. it's public information. How uh, you update the the how Microsoft is updating the Windows itself for you know. And this is what we are using behind the scenes on our CI/CD to, to create the the what we call golden image. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna. Uh, to... Who who is responsible on to to do the quality of golden images? I think it really depends on the distro. Um, you know, if certain uh, oh, distributions have it as part of their release process. With that solution, we are able to create something that every night has the latest and greatest and all the service effects and patches for Windows 10, 11 today. And they are working on also to have the servers. Okay. So I put it as a note in the in the meeting for folks to they can check that out. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Um, so let's go to the. We just have a few minutes here um, left. So the first issue that we have is about resizing a volume after the clone. And so uh, right now we we require uh, the the size to be the same as the source. Um, and then it would be a separate uh, action that's needed by the, the user to enlarge the PVC. Um, and I think the issue here is requesting that it could be done and orchestrated by CDI itself. So that resize could be done as part of the clone operation so that when we uh, regard it as done, it has the size that you want. Um, this has been around for a little while. It's getting the yeah the life cycle rotten and stuff. So I guess the question is, um, well, I'm just raising awareness here. Is there any discussion about it? So the the biggest issue is figuring out you know if there's more than one partition on this disk, which partition do we resize after we resize the actual disk image? So. Right. So yeah, obviously a resize has, uh, well, maybe not so obviously, has two parts, which is the making the storage container itself larger, um, like, and then how the how the, the virtual machine actually uses the free space. And I think in the past, CDI has taken a hands off approach to that second piece, because we can't possibly understand how a user is going to want to make use of the additional space. Um, it does seem that we could uh, resize the PVC, though, um, but that's less useful then because, yeah, I mean, you'll have a bigger disk, but the image will have to be sort of taught how to use that extra space. So at, at this point, we do support resizing the actual disk. So you'll, you'll end up with more free space on your disk. It's just that 
then you need to do the second step where the guest gets to resize, you know, whichever partition it needs to, to actually use that space. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, um, somebody from Core Weave, uh, apparently they have something that does this. Uh, maybe we can ping them, see what they have. Um, okay, I'm not seeing that. Here. It's uh, Sol Solanke. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's a little old, um, but yeah, I haven't it, seen. It, it, it is old. I'm, I'm assuming that they're doing something specific for their uh, for their system, but you know, I, I'd like to see it because um, I, I I do think it it would be nice to have something. Um, that actually also you know, resizes the guest. It's just making sure we do that for, you know, all the major operating systems, etc. Uh, be nice. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's impossible to know uh, how to do that automatically without understanding uh, what's in the image uh, that's right. being cloned. So there's lots of different ways that you could construct that image, and we don't have a way of making sure we do that that right for everything. I guess I'm confused about what what's missing. I mean, obviously the guest part I get, but you can clone a source PVC to a larger target, and then when the VM is started, there's the code that will online resize the disk image. So, yeah, okay. but that's that's the disk image. That's not the partition. So once you're done booting, your your disk that you see in your VM is the same size as before. You now have to yeah. resize the partition. To is be that what's being and asked here? Though I don't see any. I don't see I don't think the guest. Asked. I don't think that's what's being asked here. Oh, the, well, this... in, if if that's not what's being asked here, then then we have you know we have the resize. Uh, I'm, I thought what we were being asked here was the actual resize of the guest. No, they're, they're talking about resizing the, the I, maybe at one point in time, you could only clone to the same size P target. And then you have to resize the PVC, but uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what, what exactly is, is being asked for because you, you, as far as I'm aware, you should be able to clone into a larger PVC. And then okay. yes, the disk image, the, the, um, image file will then uh, still be the smaller size, but it will get resized when the VM starts if the online resize feature gate is enabled. Uh, so may maybe we should ask if, if that actually solves the, the issue, and if so, we can close it. Um, um, and it seems... Uh, that uh, that this issue can be closed. It is possible to clone to a larger PVC and the online resize functionality uh, will handle um, any resizing. Uh, yeah. We'll do this and then see if we uh, get any comments. Um, yeah, I think the so there are things you can do for guest resizing, like partitions and stuff. Uh, you can use Tecton pipelines or other kind of automation that takes care of that um, if you want to. Uh, and that gives you the opportunity to have something that's a little bit more custom to the environment that you have. Um, okay, this next issue, which we have just about zero time to discuss, so let's see, um, is data volume progress improvement metrics collection. Um, yeah, so basically right now the controller actually connects to the importer pod directly 
to get the uh, you know progress updates. And this looks like it's instead of hitting the uh, pod IP directly, uh, they want us to create a service, and then we can hit the service instead of the pod. Okay. Um, this you know is apparently for um, uh, if you have uh, specific network policies that don't allow you to directly connect to pods. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sad to say that we don't have time to dig into this one any further. I wanted to take just one second to thank everybody for joining this first uh, SIG storage meeting. Um, it was great to get everybody together in a forum where we can discuss storage issues. Um, we will be doing this on a, uh, a biweekly basis. So in two weeks, we'll be back here again. Uh, I would love to see you guys back. And um, yeah, let's definitely put those uh, agenda items onto the agenda and, um, and have some good discussions here. So thanks again and uh, have a great week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. All bye. right. Bye-bye.